Hi, welcome everyone to our second webinar series in the Perceptions of Risk in the Himalaya uh, 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 series of talks. Uh, before I give an introduction, I'll invite Tejaswini Niranjana to say a few words and then I'll get back to describing the webinar series. Hello everyone, uh, pleasure to have you all with us uh, for the second of this uh, series on uh, uh, risk perceptions of risk in the Himalayas. I'm the director of the Center for Integration Research at Ahmedabad University. Uh, we have a number of series running at the moment. Uh, and this is, uh, again, is going to be a very popular one, I can see. Uh, we have a wonderful lineup of speakers for the year. Uh, do go to our website to see the list of speakers and also to check out the other offerings we have in terms of webinars and also in-person events. In fact, we hope that this one, uh, which is part of our Himalayan Asia initiative, is actually going to be an in-person workshop uh, by the end of 2024. And the credit to all of this goes to Suchismita Das, my colleague, uh, and to Neil, Kumar, Neil Kamal Shapagen. I don't know if he's here with us, Neil. Um, and uh, they're the ones who coordinate the Himalayan Asia activities. Welcome to our speaker, Aditi Saraf, and uh, Suchismita will now do a more proper introduction. Thank you for being with us today. Um, thank you, Tejaswini. So welcome again, everyone. As I said, I'm Suchasmita Das. I'm an assistant professor at Ahmedabad University and a fellow at the Center for Inter-Asian Research. I am broadly an environmental anthropologist, primarily working in the Eastern Himalayan state of Sikkim. So I began to think about risk as a concept through my recent ethnographic work, which looks at infrastructure collapse being precipitated by recurrent landslides and thereby examining forms of vulnerability that emerge at the intersections of development aspirations, climate change impact, and the cultural politics of the frontier region. So uh, then in conceptualizing this webinar, what we aim to do is to bring together researchers from different disciplines, working across different regions in the Himalayas to reflect on how the, the notions of risk and allied terms such as crisis, vulnerability, disaster, have been constitutive in shaping the materiality, geopolitics, cultural articulations, and the history of the Himalayas. We had our first talk by Dr. Shubra Sharma, which is up now on YouTube. And in that, I go into a little bit more detail of uh, about the scope of the webinar. So I'll not repeat myself here. You can check out our YouTube videos. Um, if our aim is to historicize, to denaturalize the concept of risk and to ask about its implications in shaping the life worlds, the politics, the imaginary of the Himalayan region, we could not have had a more apt speaker than Dr. Aditi Sara. Her ethnographic exploration of risk as a practice that traders in Kashmir are imbricated in astutely opens up larger questions about state sovereignty, about histories of transregional commerce that do not square with national cartographic or economic boundary making about everyday experiences of political vulnerability as well. So we are glad that today we get to hear a part of her very generative scholarship in our uh, webinar series. In today's talk, drawing on our fieldwork and archival data from com colonial commercial regulations, Dr. Sarap explores how trade is an important field in which and through which political power is expressed and contested. She will discuss how historical exchange communities and their credit practices that evolved in facilitating long distance trade now face the risk of criminalization and how such risks are being navigated in the face of increasingly stringent territorialization measures being undertaken by the state. Uh, Aditi Saraf teaches, at, uh, teaches cultural anthropology at Utrecht University. Her research investigates entanglements between commerce, sovereignty and ecology in the Kashmir region. More broadly, she's interested in questions related to economic and political anthropology, frontiers and mobility, militarization and placemaking practices. Her writings have been published in uh, The American Ethnologist in Economy and Society, the Oxford Research Encyclopedia of Anthropology, and also in other accessible sources such as the Caravan Magazine. So with this very short introduction, I will now turn it over to Aditi and uh, hear her talk for the next 40, 45 minutes. Welcome, Aditi, and thank you for agreeing to be a part of this series. Uh, thank you so much for inviting uh, me to speak today. Um, thank you especially to Satvik, Tejaswini, to Neil, who I haven't met yet. And above all, to you, Suchi Smita, for, you know, organizing everything long distance. I'm really excited to share my work with all of you. Uh, can everybody hear me or, and see the screen, the first slide, at least? Uh, I can only see Suchi Smita. So. Um, 
is all is everything i think everybody else is muted but uh, it seems like okay yes yes okay, yes, okay it's chat okay. okay great um so as sushmita mentioned i'm a socio cultural anthropologist and i combine ethnographic and archival methods to research the intersections of commerce sovereignty and ecology in the kashmir region um and the perspective that i explore today is a political economy on risk the the category of risk that i um explore today is a political economic one uh now for market economists and more generally in the economist risk refers to the measurement management and the reduction of uncertain outcomes in order to maximize returns right this is the standard uh market economics uh definition and i hope that in my talk i can expand this category of risk to ask what are other kinds of risks undertaken while exchanging goods payments and ideas in certain places uh for instance in disputed highland borderlands i also ask what are the regulatory norms that have historically governed exchange both material and cultural in such places and what do they tell us about the ways in which political power is expressed and contested so since i focus on the kashmir region let me begin with the most proximate event as it were so um on august 5th 2019 residents of the kashmir valley woke up to find themselves under a state imposed curfew and communications blackout in a long anticipated surprise move the indian government had read down article 370 of the constitution which had granted jammu and kashmir special status and nominal autonomy troops were funneled into the kashmir valley already one of the world's most densely militarized zones there were mass arrests including of elected politicians separatist leaders and those identified as and i quote potential crowd mobilizers the latter included prominent businessmen and leaders of local market associations and bazaar committees a few weeks later again in august 2019 the state imposed curfew eased the indian government was eager to project normalcy the idea that people in kashmir had accepted and were content with indian rule and conveyed through media images of ordinary rhythms of life being resumed so buzzing markets streets schools and offices people milling about but however the reality on the ground was quite different markets remained shuttered and streets were empty people stayed indoors and children missed school despite the despite the communications blackout social consensus had built around enacting a civilian led hartal which is locally called the civil curfew to reject the charade of normalcy two years later the state imposed normalcy more forcefully in 2021 on the second anniversary anniversary of august 5th hartals that had been called by traders in various towns and cities of kashmir were aggressively suppressed men dressed in plain clothes and accompanied by police vans reportedly broke locks on doors throwing open shuttered shops and threatening traders with arrest under the public safety act or the psa which enables the police to detain people without trial for up to 2 years the kashmiri artist meer sohail marked the occasion with an illustration of a police baton and a cocked gun functioning as a door as a shop's door stop forcing it to stay open now how do markets become the sites of competing definitions of normalcy why did the suppression of hartals and the incarceration of traders and business leaders become official state policy and what to make of the fact that in 2019 or actually since 2016 demonetization actually kashmir's regional economy has been the direct target of the state while the removal of rights to own and sell land from permanent residents is widely perceived as the most devastating aspect of the 2019 ruling other forms of local economic organization uh, most of which i actually followed during my field work have also been targeted such as cross loc trade and informal credit practices since 2009 i conducted field work in srinagar's bazaars where ordinary rhythms of buying selling and matar gashti just hanging out intersected with routines of militarization and resistance bazaars were public places visible arenas for protests barricades but also the repairing of frayed social relations 
Their built environment bore signs of political violence. Bullet holes peppered facades, dark broken windows, betrayed buildings that had once served as torture centers, and resistance graffiti appeared on peeling walls. But like elsewhere, Srinagar's bazaars were also bustling commercial and social spaces, full of family businesses dealing in Kashmiri commodities like shawls, carpets, dry fruits, global fashion brands, cafes and bakeries, supermarkets, and consumer electronics. From their carts, smaller vendors sold roasted chestnuts and hand-pressed sugarcane juice. This visible consumption and prosperity in 2012 and 2013, when I uh, did most of my kind of long-term fieldwork, prompted some visitors to exclaim, and I quote, that Kashmir did not look like a conflict zone. At other times, however, hartals rendered the bazaar eerily quiet. Uniformed men with slung guns would spill out of sandbag and barbed wire bunkers seemingly at a moment's notice. During the militancy and counterinsurgency, which lasted from 18, uh, 1989 to 2002, insurgent bombs, military arson, and gunfire scattered bazaars with traders and customers caught in the crossfire. Businesses changed hands. New players moved into commercial wholesale and retail. Traders joked that Kashmir itself had become a gigantic bazaar where politicians, soldiers, intelligence officers, and double agents made massive profits from the shadow economies of war. Nevertheless, for traders, or more specifically, the, the bazaar, or more specifically, tijarat, the Urdu word for trade, also evoked older connections and memories. Looking past the grim, grim present, they spoke of being part of historical Silk Route networks, which crossed the Himalayas and stretched beyond the national maps of India, Pakistan, and China. Traders spoke of Mari, Amritsar, Multan, Rawalpindi, Kabul, Kashgar, Lhasa, Samarkand, and Bukhara, places that for the most part they had not seen. Many even claimed that their own ancestors had come from elsewhere via trade routes to Srinagar, sometimes as far back as centuries ago. The traders then imagined themselves to be at once in a Kashmir, which was a fertile in intermontane valley, 84 by 24 miles, and another Kashmir that recalled a wider region whose boundaries kept shifting, traversing, and connecting multiple mountain ranges, the Karakoram, the Himalayas, the Pamirs, as well as multiple political entities. These, two spa these spatial imaginaries variously shape Kashmir as a frontier. On one hand, a dissident periphery for the Indian state that must be integrated, and equally a trans-regional zone in which exchanges with numerous locals and political entities shape the socio-political landscape. I am interested in how this imagined Kashmir of the frontier lives on in and shapes the political discourse and critique in the bazaars of Kashmir where I walked and worked. Scholarship on Kashmir has tended to privilege either nationalism in its major and minor forms or religious divisions between Hindus and Muslims as the dominant motors of political conflict. In my research, I show that attention to credit and market networks across national boundaries that incorporated religiously diverse trading diasporas provide a different mode for reading the dispute. Rather than focus on nationalism and communal tension, they shift our attention to Kashmir's history as a long frontier prior to its fragmentation by competing empires and nation states. Now I use the term frontier in full awareness of its weighty entanglement with colonial and capitalist violence and extraction. But I also find it a useful analytic for investigating how alternate definitions of living together through exchange, trust buildings, and collective identities are crafted in histories of trans-Himalayan trade, and how they serve as prisons to a past that even now surfaces on Kashmir's fraught landscape as its possible futures. In other words, how do legacies of frontier trade affect what it means to act politically in Kashmir today? I will now lay out how the rest of my talk will unfold. First, through a glimpse, and it is really going to be a glimpse, it's going to be rather dense, into the colonial archive, I will briefly index the historical importance of Kashmir's past as a long frontier to indicate how questions over political jurisdiction came to congeal around thinking about trade. 
Following that, I will focus on LOC trade as an example of how legacies of trans-Himalayan trade continue to disturb and pluralize ideas of risk and regulation and blur lines between illicit and illicit exchange. Now, LOC trade, what I call LOC trade or what everybody called it is, or rather was, a state authorized form of barter exchange. It was a non-monetized barter exchange where goods, some goods were exchanged for other goods that took place at the line of control or LOC in Jammu Kashmir, that dotted line. Inaugurated in 2008 to foster, quote, people to people contact, LOC trade was suspended in April 2019. So just a few months before August 5th on grounds of being misused to move drugs, weapons and counterfeit currency from Pakistan. I will sketch the trajectory of LOC trade and its demise against a longer economic history of the frontier. So what does a vantage from the frontier add to studies of the conflict in Kashmir? Let me present an excerpt from a letter sent by Henry Harding, the British Governor General of India, that I hope will illustrate my larger point. Harding addressed the letter to a secret political committee of the English Parliament in 1846, and I found it reproduced in a colonial military gazette. And I quote, it was not my intention to take possession of this territory. Its occupation by us would be on many accounts disadvantageous. It would bring us into collision with many powerful chiefs for whose coercion a large military establishment at a great distance from our provinces and military resources would be necessary. It would more than double the extent of our present frontier in countries assailable at every point and most difficult to defend. Races of people with whom we have hitherto no intercourse would be brought under our rule, while the territories, except in Kashmir, the valley, are comparatively unproductive and would scarcely pay the expenses of occupation and management. Now, this quote summarizes the picture of the mountainous frontier in the colonial imagination, but I want to emphasize the point that became central to my research, which is that one cannot speak of one part of the frontier without taking into account the other parts, because to speak of the frontier is to consider not one form of political jurisdiction, but many. So many chiefs, many races, many countries. The frontier terrain is evidently non-uniform and non-unified, although it appears to have a web-like consistency. I suggest that it is precisely the web of trade networks that connect the seemingly discrete parts of the frontier. An important point here is that the frontier is not a place that cannot be politically governed because clearly there is political jurisdiction of a multiple and overlapping form. How to manage and control that form is precisely what becomes the crux of Henry Harding's anxiety. And so the East India Company that governed India before it officially came under the British crown declined to occupy the frontier and instead sold it via the Treaty of Amritsar in 1846 to their ally in the Punjab Wars, a Hindu chieftain called Gulab Singh. Gulab Singh, Gulab Singh became the first Maharaja of the princely state of Jammu Kashmir, the largest under the British Indian Empire. The three primary districts of Jammu, Kashmir, and Ladakh that comprise the state alongside several smaller tri tributary chiefdoms were, and indeed still are, in themselves ethnically and culturally distinct. They had been yoked together, apparently, to preserve the networks that sustained trade in what was once the most prized commodity of the region, the toponymous Kashmir Kashmiri shawl. The eastern district of Ladakh was annexed precisely to secure control over the mountainous route through which wool from the highland goats of the Changthang region in Tibet traveled to the center of shawl manufacture, the city of Srinagar in the Kashmir Valley. After partition produced new borders, three wars over Kashmir divided the lands of the former princely state into regions controlled by India and Pakistan with various lines of control, these dotted lines all over the map, serving as the de facto political and military limits of jurisdiction. These lines are very rigid and very belligerent, despite and because both nations claim the region in its entirety through different framings. Now, because of Jammu Kashmir's post-partition trajectory, I began my own research in 2009 by following the direct effects of state violence expressed in the human rights movement around disappeared persons. 
But as my own work began to interweave with the lives of friends and colleagues, my attention shifted from the activist networks that I had gone there to study to spaces and processes that sustained everyday life and relations. While I was conducting preliminary fieldwork in Srinagar in the summer of 2010, the Azadi movement took on a renewed sense of urgency with massive public protests that began with the news of an extrajudicial or encounter killing of three young men from Baramulla who were lured to the LOC with the promise of paid work and killed by soldiers who then tried to pass off their bodies as militants in order to collect cash bounties. Civilian protests continued from June to September in 2010. Caught between shutdowns called by protest calendars and the retaliatory curfews imposed by state forces, my mundane concerns like those of my friends and neighbors began to revolve around when and where to get a liter of milk or a loaf of bread, bringing markets into view for the first time. I got curious about how the marketplace could be a productive site for thinking about political conflict and everyday life. Given strong traditions of commercial jurisprudence in Islam, um, lots of you know, prohibitions and uh, prescriptions about how to undertake trade and commerce, I decided to research um, how an Islamic moral economy that I expected to find, because at that time, the Hurriyat under you know, Saeed Ali Shagilani, who is a you know, the veteran of the Jamaat e Islami, Jammu Kashmir, he was leading the Azadi movement. So I thought that I would follow how an Islamic moral community that I expected to find organized bazaar commerce and consciousness towards supporting the idea of a Muslim political community. What I found, however, in the market practices that I subsequently observed over 22 months of fieldwork in 2012 and 13, in the networks that enabled the flow of goods and payments during strikes, curfews, and economic blockades were the inherited forms of a very different kind of moral and political economy that drew out past geographies of the movement of people and things on the overland caravan trade that historically took place on the highlands between South and Central Asia. The long-standing intractability of the Himalayan terrain with its cardinal points, as it were, mapped out by Harding as distance from the center, unmapped vastness, countless warlike chiefs, and generally unproductive landscape, meant that state presence in any form was historically tenuous and contested. Rather, my research suggests that the assemblage of credit and market networks that made up what I provisionally call the trans-Himalayan trade ecumene historically provided political and economic coherence on this terrain marked by the distributed and overlapping jurisdiction of empires, kingdoms, principalities, and nation states eventually, who all had to negotiate with each other and with traders in order to move goods on this terrain. Um, so here is the ecumene rendered on a map from the 19th century viewed if you put Kashmir at the center. Um, you will see that it's connected through various mountain uh, routes to adjacent territories of Tibet, Chinese Turkestan or present-day Xinjiang, Kabul, Samarkand, Khotan, places in present-day Afghanistan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan. This is the connected political geography that my research seeks to explore. And many of these places that were Kashmir's former trade partners also have extremely thorny relations with whichever forms of nationalism that seek to subsume them. So examining genealogies of economic regulation shows that colonial and princely control on the frontier was exercised primarily not through territorial domination or, for example, the collection of land revenue, but through the regulation of movement and exchange by evolving new pathways of mobility, new routes, and new regimes of taxation on this landscape. These are elements that, I argue, extend to post-colonial modes of securitization in the present. If, as anthropologist Timothy Mitchell has argued, that in the 20th century, the economy came to mean a self-contained totality of monetary exchanges within the defined space of the nation state, then borderland economies are inevitably messy because historically they are entangled with exchange communities that transcend the defined space of the nation state. 
This carries a specific sting in Kashmir, not least because it once formed part of ethnically diverse, interconnected and mobile webs of trans-Himalayan trade, which are now cut off by extremely hostile and militarized lines that enclose and confine movement and exchange. Cutting, blocking and criminalizing exchange networks are made into a condition of national integration. More so now than ever, when exchanges considered unruly from a particular status perspective are being intensely targeted. Justified by ideologies of transparency and inclusion, security and anti-corruption, digitization and the ease of Paytm, this has as much to do with supplanting certain exchange communities by others. And this is not something that's happening only in the borderlands, but has actually moved into the mainstream to enclose and concentrate capital in fewer hands. So scholars speak of, and I quote Nilanjan Sarkar over here, they speak of, and I quote, extraordinary levels of economic centralization and corporate consolidation currently ongoing in India. It thus becomes essential to politicize certain processes being put in place under more benign sounding terms like financialization and digitization. Now that brings me to the next part of this talk where I look at a specific slice of this process by examining LOC trade. Now LOC trade was a peculiar form of cashless barter trade that was instituted on the line of control in Jammu Kashmir as a confidence building measure or CBM. In IR, international relations uh, speak parlance, uh, CBMs are part of track two diplomacy to foster contact between non-state actors and to manage conflict outside official channels. I will reflect on LOC trade and its peculiarities by coming to it through a discussion of two categories. One has to do with risky circulations, and that is credit, and the other has to do with regulation, that is customs. By credit, um, and I'm using credit because my interlocutors always use the English word credit when they spoke of such transactions. Um, I mean informal commercial credit that some people have called, and I'm quoting Ajaz Ashraf here, a uniquely Indian way of conducting business. Trust-based informal credit forms an important basis for capital and commodity circulation in the bazaars of South Asia, and several economic historians as well as economists have worked on this. Broadly, they comprise promissory payments, that is not immediate payments, for the purchase of high volume goods that are then settled according to vernacular timelines and practices. While keeping the bazaar in motion, informal credit systems are also regarded with acute suspicion outside their networks of circulation because these networks of circulation are personalized, right? They're from direct contact. In Kashmir, this suspicion acquires another layer because of the associations of informal credit with Havala transactions that are generally viewed as channels for black money that fund terror activities. The second category that I look at is primarily regulatory customs. By customs, I mean taxes imposed on goods transported across international borders that is levied on the import and export of goods, right? So there's the whole kind of customs uh, you know, authority that operates at airports to kind of uh, survey, to keep, a, keep an eye on this. Now, customs taxes have a particularly interesting history in Jammu and Kashmir, particularly, especially when it was a princely state under the British Raj. I will talk about it very briefly because it helps us move somewhat away from the religious and demographic logics of partition that generally frame the Kashmir issue to offer a glimpse into messier histories of exchange and governance. So then I will show how these two categories of credit and customs interlock in the specific example of LOC trade. Okay. So first, what is significant about informal credit? Informal commercial credit generally comprises interest-free or interest-forgiving loans for large purchases in the marketplace. Beyond South Asia, they have been documented in other contexts where credit, considered too risky from a corporate perspective, is extended with conditions that are not easy to regularize or reproduce and elude legal enforcement, hence their designation as informal. I use informal credit as an umbrella term for practices of deferred or delayed payment. 
In Srinagar's wholesale markets where I conducted field work, traders also described themselves as operating within a credit market. Goods such as textiles, tea, dyes, kiryana were bought and sold through living institutions of credit between suppliers, wholesalers, and retail traders. For example, goods would be bought on credit, say textiles, by a shopkeeper from a wholesaler. And the money that the retailer owed the wholesaler was settled according to a continuous ongoing calendar of repayment whose conditions were based on the length and the depth of the relationship of trust between the wholesaler, the said wholesaler and the retailer. Interestingly, the money owed was never referred to as debt or curse. Instead, the term kishti or installment is used. I could not access the intricacies of kishti calculations because conditions of repayment comprise trade secrets. But regardless of how it was calculated, kishti was obviously distinct from kars or debt defined as time-bound payment. Basically, the system rested on the assumption that the debts would not be completely repaid before goods on credit would be taken again. Hence, these relationships were like a like an ongoing relationship, they were like a turning wheel. A gadi ki paye ki tarah chalta rehta hai, one trader said to me to describe its circular rhythms. However, during my fieldwork, I also understood that trust-based credit flows had to traverse multiple levels of mistrust. Newer traders trying to break into wholesale trade viewed old credit relations as forms of clientelism, incompatible with modern, modern commerce, if not suspiciously close to forms of speculation forbidden under Islam. Regulatory officials, tax officials, saw informal credit facilitating wealth flows that eluded taxes without, despite being in circulation. So Barbara Harris White has actually suggested that turning a blind eye to this kind of tax evasion has constituted a time-honored form of state subsidy to traders, which is of course now also withdrawn by tighter GST laws. The idea that such informal credit systems don't leave a paper trail and they therefore cannot be transparent, which is not entirely accurate, underlies many of these suspicions. And because of the political climate around Kashmir, any unaccounted for sum of money, however mundane it can be, can become vulnerable to Hawala accusations. Now, while the term Hawala conjures all kinds of threatening images, black money, terror funds, the literal meaning of Hawala is quite tame. It means simply to transfer. Fundamentally, it entails the transfer of money through a network of brokers or Hawala dars, which is often glossed as money transferred without the movement of cash. Now, this is not cashlessness as defined in the language of dig digitization, but a form of deferred payment, kind of like informal credit. Um, the basic structure of Hawala is as such, and I really love this image because I realized later that I found it on a link apparently on howtovanish.com, but I didn't know that at that time. It's really a very simplified uh, kind of structure, breakdown of the structure. So for example, client A in Delhi transact uh, transacts with um, broker or Hawaladar A in Delhi in order to transfer money, say, to her sister in Bombay. So broker A in Delhi calls broker B in Bombay, who gives the required money to the intended recipient or sister. Then Hawaladars A and B settle accounts between themselves. Now, this is the basic structure, but these payments or these settlements can involve many formal and informal financial instruments in lieu of immediate payment in cash. For example, post-dated checks, indigenous bills of credit and remittance, such as promissory note, notes known as hundi, and of course, hundis printed on stamp paper are legally negotiable. Even financial intelligence officers concede that such kinds of hawala transactions are related or even integral to existing business dealings as modes of settling debts, evading tax, or balancing outstanding accounts by over and under invoicing goods, that is by stating prices of goods as less or more than what is actually paid. These adjustments are made in personalized networks and the resulting inscrutability produces anxiety. However, 
as Marina Martin has argued, both Hawala and, Hund and Hundi are interrelated and interchangeable systems that point to indigenous systems for financing long distance trade and integrating far flung markets. Evidence from colonial archives and oral narratives emphasize the centrality of such informal credit to trans-Himalayan caravan trade networks in which Kashmir was an important regional node. These systems allow traders to move goods over risky desert and mountain landscapes, through raids, through avalanches and over high mountain passes without having to carry large amounts of money on their person. At present, no trader in Kashmir ever refers to their credit transactions as Hawala, and therefore they use only the English term credit. And during fieldwork, I made sure to never utter that word around my interlocutors. However, a conversation in Delhi with an elderly widow from a Punjabi Hindu or Khatri family um, that was once based, uh, that, that was a trading family that was once based in Peshawar in the Khyber Pakhtunwa region of Pakistan, revealed an important dimension of Hawala in trade. When I questioned her about the difference between Hundi and Hawala, she said she did not know what Hundi meant, but understood Hawala to be, and I quote, direct person-to-person -person contact using code words. I'm quoting her now. Hawala means trade and direct person-to-person -person contact. I remember goods coming into Peshawar on the back of camels. At that time, traders used quotes, codes with each other to communicate how many peties, which is the Punjabi word for lakh, the goods were worth. This code was Hawala. It was personal, but understood by those within the trading community to enable trader to trade a contact, but sometimes also through middlemen. So how did something that signify complex trade networks and negotiations become such a sinister stereotype for black money? That is a story that I will not go into today, um, but I'm happy to, you know, address it during Q&A if you want. Elsewhere in a different paper, I show how the 1991 Hawala scandal in India and the global war on terror had much to do with stigmatizing this term. Um, but now I will move from circulation to regulation, from credit to customs, with special reference to the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir under Dogra rule. Now, taxation under Dogras was notoriously extractive, uh, particularly the high taxes levied on shawl weavers and the infamous compulsory labor or begar that was extracted from people in the countryside were key issues of both or key causes actually of both distress as well as dissent. Customs taxes, however, that were imposed on the princely state's borders was central to the princely purse and princely rule in Kashmir in a different way. Customs taxes form the largest proportion of the Kashmir Darbar's earnings, much more than land revenue, for example. And the right to collect customs duties was an important aspect of princely sovereignty exercised vis-a-vis -vis external powers. So, for example, in order to enable the tax-free movement of trans-Himalayan caravan traders and goods from Central Asia to British India through the princely state territories. Now, the colonial government, the British Raj was really obsessed with like doing trade with Central Asia, right? There was almost like a fabulous account that you might remember. For example, those of you who have read uh, Rudyard Kipling's Kim, you know, that starts with the account of these Afghan traders and Kashmiri traders, all kind of negotiating on sing, you know, sitting around in the caravansarais of La Lahore. And of course, these traders were also, you know, uh, participated not just in exchange, but also espionage with these like fabled in these kind of inaccessible lands and fabled wealth of Central Asia. Um but um, but so the British government was very keen to enable the tax free movement of goods through, you know, the uh, through the princely state into the Indian provinces. But for that, in order to forgive, uh, in order for the princely state to forgive the traders taxes, the British Raj had to annually reimburse the entire customs amount to the Maharaja. Um, so when an so this was so important that when an Indian Federation of Provinces and Princely States was first proposed by the Government of India Act of 1935, the Hindu Dogra Maharaja, Hari Singh of Jammu and Kashmir, actually declined to join it since it would mean that the Darbar would have to surrender the right to collect customs at its borders and allow free passage of goods to the Indian provinces. 
His decision surprised colonial officers, as it might contemporary Hindu nationalists, who assumed that the Hindu Maharaja would be, I quote, for communal reasons, a starter in the Federation states. Hafsa Kanjwal writes that Sheikh Abdullah, Jammu and Kashmir's first chief minister after the end of Dogra rule, had also been adamant in maintaining customs duties after 1947. These were eventually removed by his successor, Bakshi Ghulam Muhammad, in 1954, who came into power when Sheikh Abdullah was put in jail. Now, against this history, LOC trade becomes really interesting precisely because its protocols revolved around the exemption rather than the collection of customs duties. So what exactly was LOC trade and how did it come to be? In 2008, following escalated protests in Kashmir around the Amarnath land transfer controversy and uh, the economic blockade imposed from Jammu, a state-authorized form of cashless barter exchange was instituted at the line of control in LOC. During the protests, several marches had been, and during the economic blockade, several marches had been taken out to the LOC with slogans expressing the intention to break it and the right to trade with the other side. Following on these protests, LOC trade ostensibly sought to manage conflict through trade between LOC East and LOC West. However, protocols applied to LOC trade had to ensure that the LOC did not get cast as an international border, which is something unacceptable to both the governments of India and Pakistan, as well as to people in Kashmir who did not consent to a divided homeland. Cashless barter thus emerged as a regulatory idiosyncrasy agreed upon by all sides, India, Pakistan, as well as Kashmir's business leaders, primarily to avoid vexed questions around customs taxes and who would pay it and for what questions that would normally apply at national ports of entry. So to deflect customs taxes while allowing exchange, the standard operating procedures decreed that a limited list of locally produced goods, for example, almond, uh, badam, almond, namda rags, willow bats, etc., would be exchanged through barter trade only, right? So goods would be exchanged for other goods without money changing hands. And because LOC exchange was crafted as barter in local goods, no money changed hands and no taxes were paid and no customs therefore needed to be levied. I began fieldwork in Srinagar soon after cross LOC trade was inaugurated. While most traders did not buy into the fiction of trade creating peace, LOC exchange was a long awaited first step of making connections across their divided homeland. Bazaar talk, talk would often turn towards the topic of LOC trade with excerpts read out from local newspaper reports passed down the row of shops. These reports carried lively details of conflicts that arose due to its bizarre protocols, such as around bartering non-local commodities like green moon, garlic and bananas, sparring between the security forces of India and Pakistan, and cross LOC scuffles between traders over balancing payments in a non-monetized context. Barter goods were exchanged through the passage of trucks, such as the one you see in this image, on either side of the LOC that were released according to highly regulated and securitized procedures that involved lots of forms and also involved a lot of security agencies, border police, local police escorts, and several other intelligence components. Now, after demonetization, the sundry exchange practices were brought under intensified surveillance, and many traders in Kashmir were investigated and arrested on prima facie suspicion of Hawala transactions for funding terror acts. The National Investigating Agency, or the NIA, singled out LOC trade for facilitating Hawala transfers to move drugs, weapons, and counterfeit currency from Pakistan. According to the NIA, this was achieved through over and under invoicing of goods, that is, by bartering goods of non-equivalent value instead of a zero-sum exchange with the residue channel for funding various terror activities. Now, my own conversations with LOC traders between 2013 and 2018 provided a very different context for this dubious financial anomalies reported by the NIA. While I am not equipped to argue for the guilt or innocence of individual traders, 
I want to highlight the dangerous slippage from everyday trade to terror funding that makes trading in Kashmir at the LOC or elsewhere so risky. So one LOC trader emphasized that the most common reason for under or over invoicing in barter trade was simply that because to make profit, they had to make multiple transactions before eventually settling accounts with trade partners from the other side. Since profit depended on capitalizing very quickly on price differentials of bartered goods, for example, if I were to barter miswak for almonds, they would be very differently priced, but it would mean a certain kind of calculation that you have to capitalize very quickly on. Um, the balancing of accounts between traders on each side working in a cashless framework was secured over long periods of forecast and equivalence. This entailed multiple exchanges over a long period of time. While formal documents recorded non-equivalence of the bartered goods, asymmetrical exchange or over and under invoicing were precisely forms of informal credit. They were investments in long-term ongoing trade relationships in which accounts were settled only later and which were constrained uh, by the cashless protocols of a militarized bureaucracy. At other times, financial irregular irregularities produced by the procedural intricacies of LOC trade, um, at other times, sorry, financial irregularities were produced precisely by the procedural intricacies of LOC trade. So, for example, traders at the LOC took turns sending their trucks according to a roster system. Uh, because of the heavy security, only a limited number of trucks could ply on any given day. So the more active traders often bought others' position on the roster on a profit-sharing basis. In one case, I was told the unaccounted money that was assumed to be a Hawala transaction was simply payment received by the trader for selling his turn on the roster to a more active trader, a routine irregularity leveraged by LOC traders. Now, I present these snapshots to track the gap between the legal transcripts and the mundane lives of informal credit and the distinctive positioning of Kashmiri traders within this space. These indicated that what gets called hawala in these circumstances are affordances that permit cross-border transactions and, in fact, are often produced by state-crafted artifacts for managing conflict. This is not to deny the alterity of informal credit or to romanticize it. Rather, it is to acknowledge that in their past and present capacity to facilitate economic transactions between historically salient exchange communities that are currently separated and criminalized by militarized borders, Hawala poses a much more complex challenge to the state than what is revealed in the language of law. In Kashmir, territorial integration has always been closely associated with economic integration through aid packages materialized in Kashmir's massive debt to the central government and its characterization as a begging bowl. Informal credit opens up a domain of vernacular transactions that may fall outside the conduits of capital put in place by the state, but they are not invariably corrupt, anti-national or terroristic. Supply chains and traces of the human and non-human agents, brokers, mules, bills of credit, advertising pamphlets, trade directories, and other commercial paperwork that I encountered during fieldwork extended not only into the Indian mainland, but also beyond, further west, further east and north, and across hostile borders. They mapped out affiliations that are not permitted expression in the polarized languages that frame the conflict in Kashmir. Acknowledging such affiliative communities means approaching Hawala accusations with caution. It means returning informal credit to historical contexts of exchange. And it means attending to political, economic, rather than communal questions in thinking about the conflict in Kashmir. Certainly, traders have a reputation for subterfuge. But this subterfuge may also gesture at secrecy that cross-cutting attachments must assume within a hostile conflict. This reputation for subterfuge also prompts us to think about the deflections, evasions, and deceit that are often imputed to traders, but might actually also be performed by the state in order to manage contestations of its own sovereignty and legitimacy. I'll stop here. Thank you.
thank you so much, Aditi. This was very enlightening and also very encompassing, both in terms of history and in terms of uh, thinking about the different domains of politics, economics, etc. Very, very fascinating. Thank, thank you. you so much. Um, let me just uh, try and unshare my screen. Yes. And meanwhile, yeah. we can start taking questions. So if people can raise their hands or type out their questions in the chat box, then we can get started. So, okay, I think Tejaswini has a question. Uh, okay, uh, maybe we'll wait for the screen to be unshared. Oh, you were stopped. Uh, One sec, they should okay. do it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so... To be uh, unmuted. Uh, okay, so uh, can the host please unmute? Yeah, I'm unmuted. Okay. Uh, this is not really a question, but just uh, uh, you know, a, a comment of like deep appreciation for your wonderful talk. Um, I've actually been reading not on this period, but on a much more ancient period. Uh, for other for another project, I've been looking at two thousand years of movement across mm -hmm. the Trans Himalayan region, say from Kashmir to China and parts beyond. Mm -hmm. And so this is really fascinating to think of the names that I evoked in the trans Himalayan region, to find them taking on such a contemporary uh, valence, if you like, mm -hmm. was for me extremely fascinating. Uh, and I really loved it. Um, I think that this uh, refocusing on uh, political economy and the idea of the trans Himalayan region uh, is very much in the spirit of what we try to do at the Center for Interagent Research that we are not stuck with any uh, form of methodological nationalism, mm -hmm. like it ends up happening in, say, international relations, for example, not to, like, you know, uh, belabor the point, but, you know, you also mentioned that, right? <laughs> uh, and in doing so, what do we lose? What do we not see? Uh, what And what are the many intricate processes uh, concerning all these questions that we're also bothered about? Uh, how do they, um, you know, in, in some sense, display themselves uh, mm -hmm. before us? I think that you've showed us methodologically how that's possible. And uh, we really look forward to uh, more work by you and more interaction with our center. Thank you so much, Aditi. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tejasuri. I was also really surprised because, you know, I went into Kashmir without expecting because it's so it's it's such a overdetermined uh, place and it's overdetermined by certain languages. So I was very surprised, for example, to find Punjabi Khatri traders operating out of downtown Srinagar, seeing these like fragments that I couldn't place them. I couldn't place them in the languages that were already kind of overdetermined. Thing it was only after going to the archives that I was like, oh God, these are commercial regulation, you know, exchange histories that have continued for thousands of years, but are also very much present. They are, they are kind of ways of expressing different ideas of place and different ideas of governance and different ideas of self and sovereign governance, basically. So yeah, uh, thank you for that. And I think I've been reading a lot also of these histories of exchange, but they all make them sound like this is the past and this is nostalgia. And I want to be very clear in my work that this is not nostalgia. I don't even want to romanticize it. Like traders and markets are Neither of them are like kind of, you know, domains of freedom as such, but they are domains for different expressions of geographies, different geographies and sovereignties. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Aditi. So we have a question by Mr. Bashir Ahmed next. So uh, we can unmute uh, Satvik, please. Yeah. Uh, please. Hello. <laughs> uh, do, do you hear from me? Yes, yes, yes. I do hear. I do hear you. So. Yeah, I am from Kashmir. I have had a quite good research on the 19th century. In fact, I have touched the uh, ancient medieval and modern period of Kashmir history in depth. Mm -hmm. You have mentioned that uh, Maharaja was taxed by the uh, colonial British clo colonial rulers uh, for the goods and exchange to the mainland, ma mainland India during the uh, during the Dogra rule period. But uh, I believe it's vice versa. Uh, the taxes are reimbursed by the by the colonial government to the Maharaja. Yeah. No, 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 no. It was Maharaja who who paid the taxes to the colonial rulers. Not the colonial rulers were were paid. Uh, in fact, it was vice versa. You told that colonial rulers, uh, the 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 East India Company, paid uh, to the Dogra rulers. Uh, for the freight of the uh, commodities uh, which they pass through the 
uh, these uh, trans Himalayan valleys, especially through Kashmir Valley. Uh, they didn't pay. The English people didn't pay. In fact, uh, Dogra was uh, Dogra was uh, paying annual annual uh, what do you call annual taxes to the to the English people uh, in a state. Uh, Oh, actually, no, actually, I mean, from what I could gather from the um, from the uh, trade corridor, this was on this was uh, on the trade. There was a particular corridor that was carved out to enable the tax free goods. The Dogras did pay the British rulers. They paid them tribute. They paid them to buy the lands of Kashmir. Um, mm. But on this, uh, but on this, like uh, commercial treaty that carved out a trade corridor, trade corridor through the territories for tax-free movement of goods between Central Asia and British India. In order for the goods to remain tax-free, the British had to annually pay the darbar, the customs that they would otherwise lose by allowing tax-free movement. So this was another category of trade that took place under what was called bonded trade. Uh, because these goods traveled in bond. And there's an entire category of administrative reports that, and it continued for a really long time, including like there were conflicts and this was under joint uh, jurisdiction of the colonial as well as the Darbar's officers. And there were many fights between them. And the mm -hmm. colonial of officers kept saying that, why are we continuing to do this? You know, the, the value of the goods are declining. This was from the 30s, 1930s. The values of the goods are declining, but the annual customs rate is increasing. You know, we prevent, we actually did it in order to kind of uh, make British goods go there. Now, so, now Soviet goods are coming into British India. So why are we continuing to do this? But for various reasons uh, about which I write elsewhere, the trade corridor was actually allowed to persist uh, because this like kind of, of appointment of British officials at the various check posts also enabled them to, again, surveil and control the movement of flows on this corridor from Soviet Asia during the, you know, the ups and falls, uh, the upheavals of more than half a century. So this is a particular, again, it's an artifact of movement that was placed particularly on the frontier. And that is what I'm referring to in relation to Clos LOC trade, which is another artifact. It's another bizarre trade artifact that was instituted. So why do these artifacts keep coming on this terrain again and again? Is the conceptual question that I'm asking? How do you how do you how do you rate the political economy of Kashmir during the during the eighteen hundred during the during the Dogra rule? How do you rate this? Is was it rigid rigid political economy or was it flexible? I think it was a managed political economy with various idiosyncrasies. Idiosyncrasies. Uh, so, for example, land remained inalienable, immovable property was never you yes. were not able to sell. But these customs taxes were a very interesting way in which, you know, negotiations with other powers, including with the British suzerainty was um, was um, was negotiated. But of course, I don't know all of political economy about that. You know, since you've done ancient, medieval, modern, you would have a much broader range. I'm interested really in looking at these connections between present day, I'm an anthropologist, so I kind of study what I see through participant observation and connecting them to these histories. So that's the way that I look at the history. I don't have the, you know, kind of the long. long broader, history. broader, broader uh, spectrum. That's right. Uh, uh, have you read the recent paper uh, on retracing the realistic disaster scenario of Kashmir Valley? I'm trying to follow it, but yeah, I mean, I, I mean, some of it is also so. I, nobody knows what's happening after the horrible things that happened uh, with. No, no, no. State. I'm talking about the Dogra rule. Oh no, I did not. No, no, I haven't read the papers on Dogra. You better mm -hmm. read that. It will help you a lot in your. Uh, in your... Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Mr. Ahmed. So we'll go to the next question. We can take uh, uh, Safwan's question now. Uh, thanks, Suchi. Uh, hi, Aditi. Thank hi. you for a wonderful talk. Uh, I, I missed a couple of questions right before mine, so I'm not sure if this is uh, a question that I'm repeating. Mm -hmm. uh, so two questions, basically. One, you spoke over the invoices. I was wondering, how do they maintain multiple registers? Uh, so what is it? Is it, does, is it a book format? Because I know uh, for some reason, 
many many of these traders are you know just obsessed with books and and the return you know it's literally a return mm-hmm. there's no excel sheets or there's no concept of excel itself so that was one question the other is uh, i mean i i i deal with uh, malabar and muslims over there mm-hmm. uh, and i was just wondering uh, how does the muslim navigate this hawala part because it's it's a huge thing even in malabar uh, so what is the ethical bit over here so so how do we even understand the ethical over here because i i see the muslim interlocutor actually engaging with say what we call or what we understand as smuggling in a very ethical manner i mean they think that that is part of uh the very essence with which that they should move about so so mm-hmm. how do we understand that as anthropologists how how do we even uh find vocabularies that will then you know sort of give that meaning of what the ethical is over here etc so so that's that's something that's really been uh, on my mind and i thought it would be wonderful to listen to you well thank you so much for the question the truth is i'm also thinking about it right because what how a the one thing i want to make sure is that these are not like kind of old ancient systems that are bound to be taken over by capitalism they have always kind of moved in very sophisticated manner with modern financial instruments and things like that what distinguishes them is that their regulatory norms their exchange community that they move between personalized networks of trust and this is trust which is looks completely different from what it looks like in the banking regime from the financial digital regime and a lot of the fights that a lot of the kind of targeting of the informal economy basically means i mean they are basically forms of dispossession that want to take out capital I mean, if you look at it from a very, like political, like you might have different commitments about what should or should not happen with something like the economy, but what this is, what a lot of these laws uh, that are put in place by the state are kind of means of extracting capital from these networks and concentrating them in others, right, and making space for other forms of capital. That's one. um so in some ways i think that the way they commit the the, the way it's criminalized is criminalized by being painted as something black right and that has been a long discursive process so if you look at for example the last uh kind of report on these informal economy so hawala for me in that sense is any kind of informal credit transaction right and they take different forms in different networks whether it's the chat yard where they oscillate between move between caste and kin networks or cross them and the interesting thing is in the trans himalayas is that they often cross them these informal credit networks they happen between punjabi khatris kashmiri muslims sikhs so on and so forth um but if you look at the uh, the last thing that i saw was a banking commission report from the 1970s and that is really quite neutral about the way they speak about hawala it hardly comes up in the kind of inf- they talk about informal credit and then in 1991 the hawala trans and i write about uh, i write about the hawala case in a different paper where i try to look at these questions that you asked me called financial superstitions and i remember being 8 years old in 1991 and wondering what but asking my parents but why is hawala such a bad thing and nobody could explain it to me right and that case continued forever and ever and i think that case the hawala judgment uh, that was made in 1998 was kind of instrumental in kind of both opening up these practices for increased surveillance but also improvising so that you know so that certain named politicians could be let off the book and this was done through very technical means uh so this is a constant problem so when i ask financial intelligence officers like when does informal credit becomes hawala they joke they like when it goes bust you know as long as it's running smoothly it's not a crime um if you speak to officials from the terror you know kind of terrorists what if they'll say oh we only interested in informal credit when it's funding terror activities but then what happens with new laws is what constitutes terror what constitutes sedition what is the combination of these laws and the way that these anti money laundering laws are being weaponized which is what makes this uh, so dire really uh-huh. Okay, uh, so uh, thanks. I think uh, then we'll move on to Eman. Eman's question, and then we have Maya, and then Leah. Uh, yeah. Uh, hi, Aditi. Um, I'm Eman. I teach anthropology and sociology in uh, JMI New Delhi, 
And I'd begin by really thanking you for this really stimulating talk. Uh, I've been to Kashmir uh, a little bit. I've been to Uri, um, not a fieldwork trip. Uh, but obviously, like you, um, at least in bits and pieces, I got to hear things which we don't normally hear about, which raise a whole host of questions. Mm -hmm. um, and through your talk, which I found really interesting because uh, I've recently been teaching economic anthropology and sociology. So, you know, a lot of this resonates with my own uh, teaching and um, conversations with students from Kashmir, by the way. Uh, but through your talk, I detect these at least three dualisms. Uh, which I think, uh, 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 which I mean it as a uh, compliment, perhaps, uh, because of what you're trying to grapple with. So, you know, even in my research, for instance, which is not on markets, etc., uh, we keep coming across this dichotomy, this dualism between something called the state and obviously by implication, something called society. Mm -hmm. um, and through your talk, for instance, I could see that uh, uh, for, you know, uh, uh, whatever reasons you invoke the state as a monolith, uh, um, and uh, so from examples that one has known of, for instance, I would have liked to perhaps have more uh, details about what is it that you call the state in, you know, specific ethno-historical locations. Uh, so for instance, from Kashmir, I know uh, that there are lots of trees being cut down. Uh, and that's not only Kashmir, of course, that's, you know, all the mountainous regions, it's now well documented. It's obviously an environmental crisis at this point. Uh, but the way to transport the, those trees is through Russia rifles, um, uh, army trucks, because nobody's going to stop them. If the police stops them, you know, there's going to be violence of some kind. Um, then, of course, there are these very well-known uh, incidents of, uh, uh, you know, all kinds of favors being carried by, you know, terrorists or all kinds of illegals uh, uh, via intelligence bureau and so on. The most famous one is, you know, well-documented. As Dulat has written it about it in public. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, the most famous is Sayyid Salahuddin's son who got this seat in this medical college because Dulat had a word with Farooq Abdullah and so on. And now the son is out. Mm -hmm. um, the third, for instance, is when you speak about the state, I'm immediately thinking of all these Kashmiri Muslims who are often pretty high up in the police. Uh, so the reason I'm bringing, let's say, these three... Uh, a uh, very obvious um, kind of uh, public uh, um, uh, you know, information here is, what exactly do we mean when we keep invoking the state? Uh, so are we going to include these Muslim Kashmiris within the state? Is it just, you know, GOP commander? What is it? Uh, so what happens if you're looking at actual trade practices? Who's involved? Um, again, apo apo apocryphally, um, the Abdullahs and so on, you know, like most politicians, they have all kinds of money stored away. Um, uh, in the neighboring state of Punjab, there's Amrinda, you know, it's folklore now, you know, he's involved in the drug trade. So I'm bringing all this up to just drive home the point that, you know, what is this phenomena that we keep easily labeling the state? Uh, and what is it that we are trying to uh, understand here? Uh, which is why your later uh, material about this uh, uh, business of undervoicing and invoicing is so fascinating for me. Uh, and it's so useful to think with because the thing that really comes through is that here is this empirical reality, which is represented by these, let's say, forces of order as a distortion, right? Um, uh, so for instance, um, I was writing down some of this stuff. So again, you know, the contrast is not something you are making, but actually these agents of the, you know, agents of the state or forces of order, whatever one might call them, they are constantly bringing up this business of order and disorder. Uh, look, the disorder is out there. We are the rational people. Uh, so, you know, you have this interesting discussion about Hawala, but actually Hawala turns out to be something which is very mundane. Mm -hmm. uh, now you see this kind of dynamic as so integral to the process of nation uh, state formation. Uh, so I, get, I guess I just leave you with something which, I'm, it's, which is obviously something you've been thinking about is that who is this purging of categories being done for? So, so the, NIA, I... the NIA guys know what's going on. The NIA know much more than you and me, I'm sure, that, well, it's very mundane. It's these networks which have always existed. And yet in those particular moments, post-2019 or whenever, uh, this can be fit into the character, uh, into the category of illegality, terrorism, all kinds of you know things which are against the state. So everybody knows what's going on. And yet this reality needs to be produced as a purge category between legality, illegality, state, society, and so on. So I guess I leave you with a question.
No, my question is, you know, is perfectly well taken and I use the state, I, the way I use the state is also to obscure more than, rather than stating something. I mean, A, the state form, which I take to mean particular, uh, specifically, I don't mean it at the same time with sovereignty. So my question, my larger question is that how do these contestations around re, around uh, trade express different ideas of sovereignty and what constitutes legitimate rule? Um, and seeing them around the practices of trade and tracing the history about how practices of trade were also provisioning, not just control regulation, but also provisioning were also practices of sovereignty is one way of looking at it. But I'm absolutely in agreement with you that the state form is a sh just like traders, they are shape shifting and changing from themselves, right? Which is why there's also a really interesting thing. And not just that, the state, because traders were also informal diplomats, there were a bunch of other things. The truth is that the modern nation state also trespasses on these networks, but also criminalizes them when it's expedient, particularly in places like borderlands, right? So, uh, for example, uh, one of the Kashmiri traders who was arrested after demonetization had this, and this is something that's out in the public domain, like you say, had this interview in Kashmir, where he was like, you know, I was the guy who helped bring Nawaz Sharif to prime minister's swearing in, right? Now, what do you what do you make? So I will never follow these networks. You know, this is really not something that I can either ask about, but is the A in some ways they're public secrets that, that are openly articulated. At another level, they're extremely dangerous things to follow, but they do tell you something about the exercise of power. So that's all that's all I can say in response to you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. And so next we can take Maya's question. Uh, she had messaged, and then we'll take Leah's. Maybe we can take both questions if you're yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh, yeah. So maybe let's get both the questions on board. <clears throat> okay. Uh, hi, Aditi. Thanks for such a great talk. Uh, I learned so much. Um, so actually, the uh, the ex Emmons question and your response. So this is sort of a little bit. Um, uh, perhaps uh, piggybacking or amplification on that only because I was just thinking along with you, right? As I was hearing. Um, and to me, <clears throat> what it seemed like was that your work is such an interesting um, rejoinder sort of to um, James Scott kind of exactly. um, <laughs> analysis of, you know, the politics of the ungovernable or whatever. What is the politics of the Zomia is the Zomia, Zomia. politics, the yeah, so, deliberate rebels from the state and things like right, that. Right. Yeah. So that there are topographies and exchanges across topographies and forms of kinship trade network formation that um, explicitly and intentionally evade the state form. Mm -hmm. um, and um, how rapacious the modern state form is that it tries to, you know, and all of this is cast in the light of the outside of the suspicious, uh, if it doesn't, but actually that it's precisely designed to be like that because to evade definition and control but your analysis is actually giving us that much more complicated story of how um you know sites of sovereignty and um you know through forms of exchange and formal trade etc are um, so also implicated with regimes of you know kingship regimes of you know modern governmentality securitization um, and all of that. So did you like, I guess one kind of thing is, did you have any, you must, you know, did you engage with Scott's work at all? And what did you feel about it? Um, was it useful for you? Did you totally disagree with it? Um, the other is like a very direct, small question, which is, what is the actual volume of this trade? Is it significant? Or is it mostly symbolic? Or because of the histories that it's a part of? Uh, so those are my two sort of uh, questions. Uh, okay, so can we also put Leah's question on the table and you can answer both of them together? Uh... Um, I, I mean, I also sort of build on the question, but it's at the same time slightly diverging. So if you want to take Maya's first, I'm happy to park mine for later. Uh... It's okay, okay. I'll just ask. Sorry, <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. No, no. Um, so uh, uh, this is super interesting. Um, I mean, a lot has been said about the state and the significance of the state, but 
the way you framed it was also that Kashmir, uh, the way it is read, is very overdetermined. Mm -hmm. And I want to hold on to that a bit more. Um, and if you could speak a little about um, the caste or community networks, mm -hmm. you sort of talk about it in passing and also mention at one point that the, uh, there's a crossing of networks that, you know, there are different caste communities perhaps. So if you could speak to that a little mm -hmm. and if at all um, gender masculinity was something that you um, looked at. Um, I, I remember reading this, um, I think it was Filippo Osella who wrote about masculinity and trade. Traders in Kerala. Yes, yeah. exactly. So Social responsibility. and all that. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you for those questions. Actually, all four of them are really kind of both yours and Maya's questions are very important conceptual kind of frameworks that I had to grapple with. So uh, very quickly about Scott Zomia, right? And I write about it in that, uh, you know, the encyclopedia, research encyclopedia essay that I have on frontiers, right? That this idea of the Zomia, and of course, they're the highlands and the highlands have typically been these like kind of spaces where anthropologists seek order outside the state, right? Uh, but uh, Zomi and Zomi, of course, also has his discontents, right? I absolutely, the I find it intriguing, but I, I really don't want to think about either markets or mountains as being this like kind of domain of rebellion and freedom. What I try to show and I think what the archives show is that they do kind of produce their own forms of spatial order and governance that both that kind of rise in tandem with the rise of the modern state and capitalism and not necessarily outside them, never outside them, actually, right? Um, so that is my critique. I mean, I find it a very, I mean, I'm, it's a captivating idea. And I think politically, it's a useful idea, but it's a concept. I don't know how much empirical uh, grounding it would have anywhere. And most importantly, I think what Zomia is as a concept is that kind of brings to life the different political and empirical commitments people bring to the study of such spaces. And I think in that way, it's quite an interesting thing. Um, the volume of trade actually has always been statistically insignificant. Uh, on the mountains, but symbolically completely overloaded, whether it has to do with narratives of what has been called the great game, uh, whether it has to do with LOC trade, whether it has to do with the trade corridor, where really one of the interesting questions is that, and especially in uh, comparison to maritime trade, like, okay, if the if statistically or economically in the modern sense, if it's so uh, like kind of insignificant, why are people talking about it all the time? That was actually one of the questions that kind of provoked further exploration. Um, for uh, To respond to Leia very quickly, uh, as everywhere else in South Asia, def so, and this is also kind of combines with the thing on gender, the bazaar was a, is a very male space. And I didn't realize how difficult it would, that was actually the hardest part about doing field work in 2012, 2013. I did not realize uh, being like whatever Delhi born and raised just how hard that would be it meant completely it also meant that because uh, firstly it was training in a certain form, form of deportment uh, I felt very few women who were in the marketplace most of them were replacing uh, kin who had been incapacitated or killed during the militancy they gave me some strategies yeah, I had long conversations with them but I was mostly among men and mostly among older men um and uh, it also meant that I had to curtail my uh, kind of interactions, with, not just with the kind of sociality over tea and cigarettes, but also with younger men and also with the bazaar labor or mazdoors who were kind of, you know, who were always there and kind of engaged in like kind of tasks of lifting, storing, carrying, transporting. But I had to con uh, curtail my relationships with them. So I write about that methodologically. It meant th it meant that most of my regular interlocutors were older, well-positioned, more respectable traders. Uh, and also what kind of pushed me to study the archives and focus on commercial paperwork because people would not talk to me all the time. So it was also this kind of... Um, but in terms of caste and community, and, you know, I think Amit Kumar, who's at Azim Premji, has done really interesting work on that. So obviously, there are caste divisions in the sense what, you know, Kashmir is called Peer Muridi, you know, the Saeeds and the Peer. And then there are, you know, the houseboat owners who are like kind of lower. But unlike, and this is something that I'm uh, kind of citing from a talk of Amit's that I went to, he says, but for example, you'll see in like North, in the North Indian plains, you'll see like the Julahas and the you know, the various Muslim castes will have different mosques, 
that's not true in Kashmir. All of them would go to the same places of worship and things like that. Uh, so he has done very interesting work on these castes, and particularly in the more like kind of longer handicraft based things like shawl weaving, wood carving and all, but I think these networks um, for like market knowledge and supply chain matter more. Um, but I was interested more in like the everyday local provisioning. But so I though obviously I spoke to some handicraft dealers and all. Mostly I was looking at this clothes, kiriana, that kind of thing. And that is a little more diverse. Like these are family businesses, but there are also newer traders who had also moved into retail after 1989. Many old people had also moved out. So it was also a transformed terrain. But nothing like that. So okay. it's there, but it's not there in the same way that it is in North India, say, for instance. Uh, maybe I'll use my discretion and ask a few questions myself before turning it to the two people who have raised their hand. Uh, so one of them was ethnographic in terms of this uh, cross-border trade, which is barter, which then uh, has to entail what you explained in the Hawala people who are not exchanging money, but going to settle their accounts. So what is the relation across the LOC between these particular brokers and maybe invoking your uh, the paper on trust where you this this would I assume entail some sort of trusting relationship across what has now been uh, uh, a boundary. Uh, so how does that operate? What is the sort of everyday mechanics of that was one question and the other was about uh, maybe following Leia in terms of the actual genealogy of the traders themselves and you evoked in the beginning that there is this imaginary of the traders as people who in some ways are cosmopolitan imagine themselves beyond the beyond the contemporary nation so how much of that is actual genealogy and how much of that is sort of a political ideological self positioning that was uh, 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 my yeah those are the two questions let's stick to that for now Thank you. Um, cross LOC trade, of course, is a different kind of art. art uh, you know, it's it's kind of distinctive in the sense it takes place completely away from bazaar as a public space in this highly securitized border area where normal forms of haggling that would be the mainstay of the bazaar become criminalized and kind of with suspicions of cross border violence. What's interesting, and all I can say is this: so traders always complained about having to do blind trade, and my question was always like, how do you even do this blind trade? Um, and I think like when it was set up in the various negotiations that happened in the joint chamber that kind of included traders from both sides, they could never meet after their first meeting, but sometimes they would meet in third countries like Turkey and Az Azerbaijan, right? Um, but my sense was, in fact, that was one of the rationales for it, that some of it was also to facilitate exchange between kin, who like people who had crossed over to us. It was in that moment where there was like, okay, let's try doing some, you know, every now and then there was like, oh, surrendered militants who want to come back may come back and we'll help rehabilitate. And this was also part of, uh, okay, so those who crossed over and want to maintain contents, this can be one way that they can do it. And sometimes they were trade traders who belong to such families. Uh, however, for the same reason, it became very easy to criminalize those networks as well. So again, it's one of those networks that you both kind of use, but then when it's expedient can also be like, but this is seditious and anti-national because this is the kind of exchanges that are happening. So that's all I can say about LOC trade because I honestly didn't ask any questions other than what they told me. Uh, but this, again, to come back to Leah, so this genealogy question is actually really interesting because I expected given how male the space of the bazaar was I, I expected there to be much more of a masculine ideology for example paul anderson writes about masculine ideologies in the aleppo bazaar you know before the revolution where you know patriarchal authority control over sons a control over credit networks you know is a way of like establishing your trustworthiness and your reputedness what I discovered really early in the bazaar while speaking to traders that they were really reticent to talk about their families and to talk about their households and who I thought this would be like one of the more innocuous questions, but they really did not want to talk about family histories so much, except to say that, oh, well, you know, my ancestors came from Bokhara. Many of them spoke about sons. Many of them spoke about, so it, uh, part of it is also the larger thing about war. Like many of them spoke about sons who had left and having no one to pass the business to or fights bit with their cousin when they used to own a business. But actually, these genealogies were much more fractured in very interesting ways. 
Um, and I don't know what to do with that, actually. <laughs> Thank you. That itself is quite telling. So yeah. uh, uh, let's get the last two questions together. And then uh, I think those are that is all we have time for. So Nishta, yeah. Uh, thanks, Aditi. That was such an informative and enlightening talk. Uh, <laughs> my question draws a bit on my fieldwork, which I just completed in Munsiari. Mm -hmm. And uh, there they followed the Mithar system, which was between the Indo-Tibet border region. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. Hmm. And uh, it wasn't, it, it's dissimilar from Hawala in the sense that it was the two Mithras trading with one another and then going into the markets. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm very curious because you spoke a lot about the spatial and political disruptions, but I'm also curious about the temporal disruptions, which, and how people manage that. Because uh, in uh, in Munsiari, what happened was that 1962 becomes a very significant turning point because that's when a lot of the trade, the value transfer is disrupted and lost for a lot of people that's never recovered and so in these kinds of systems where the transfer isn't immediate the temporal disruptions uh, in some cases they equally are stabilized against immediate market forces but in other cases when especially the state disrupts that temporality uh, that completely disrupts the system itself and then how do the traders sort of handle that so i was wondering if you have uh, if you've thought about that in relation to your work I'm sure you have. I just like know. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> and Prince, let's get that question also. Uh, you have to yeah. unmute uh, get the host or uh, unmute him. Uh, maybe Aditi, you want to answer this question till we figure the unmuting. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, thank you for that question. Absolutely. And the temporal, uh, the temporal disruptions are so many, right? Like 187, the fall for the demand of shawl, uh, the, the Dogra rule, then the uh, 1947, 1959, actually for Ladakh, um, it's really interesting, the blocking of the Tibetan, the Tibetan occupation was hugely um momentous and a bunch of Yarkandi traders were trapped, like literally trapped overnight in Kashmir. They're still called. So the old, uh, this trade corridor Sarai that I was talking about earlier, the old building, the old like kind of Sarai is still called Yarkan Sarai in Srinagar because that's where those traders stay. So they never saw their families again. So they married, you know, Ladakhi women and things like that. So that was a big disruption because again, all over this trans Himalayan trade, 1989 was a big disruption, but in um, Kashmir, the start of militancy is also traced by traders to the breakup of the Soviet Union and various self-determination movements happening in Central Asia, which is something you don't hear about in the mainland, right? So Azerbaijan and all, then Kabul, uh, 1989, the invasion of Afghanistan. So there are many temporal disruptions uh, that both blocked certain things and provided other kinds of affordances. But you're absolutely right that that is very much there's certainly a temporality to it as well, which is not necessarily a, a linear time, but a question of like, again, circular, almost like those credit networks. Thanks. Uh, okay, Prince, can we try again uh, to unmute you? Yes, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Perfect. Uh, hi, Aditi. Thank you so much for the presentation. It was really engaging. Uh, my name is Prince Tomer. I'm a junior researcher at Tallinn University, Estonia. For my PhD, I study infrastructure developments in Ladakh uh, in concerning the LOC and LAC. I think uh, I'm deviating a bit. Yeah, yeah. I think we have we spoken uh, briefly at some point. Email. Oh, I'm not sure. Maybe. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm deviating a bit here. But could you please share anything about the uh, cross-border infrastructure that facilitated this border trade uh, that might have come across in your research? The LOC trade. Yes. Uh, so there were these standard operating protocols and there were two trade facilitation centers. One was in uh, in the Jammu sector, one was in Uri in the Kashmir sector. And it was basically what I said, the movement of trucks carrying goods that would just stop at the trade facilitation center. I write about it elsewhere, actually, um, which was so these drivers would come wearing neon jackets from the other side. Police escorts would you know accompany them. And then work would be offloaded. And then you, I was there for only one day and I had to take permission, you know, to be there. Um, and again, I didn't ask many questions. 
um but yeah it was a whole border infrastructure and then of course the kaman bridge which is what joins the two parts had also been curated as a tourist center and a whatever thing so it was this interesting combination of tourism trade connection it was the only point of like official crossing on this ex on one of the most hostile borders in asia uh so it was very much an artifact like as it was very different from bazaar trade but for that reason very interesting but we can talk more about it. i mean i can go i can keep describing what i saw but i think that would take too much time yeah no thank you so much this is kev uh thank you so much and this is actually all of it is very reminiscent of that brief moment when in sikkim the nathula trade opened across yes. the yeah. and very yeah. similar pageantry and then which also exactly changed. imagination uh, for a brief moment till it all disappears again exactly uh, the pageantry yes exactly yeah hmm. uh, so okay on that note i think <laughs> we have run out of time and we could have easily gone on for more thank you so much aditi this was so enlightening so encompassing as i said thank you for taking the time to talk to us and all of the questions thank you to everyone for attending this and i do hope you will come for future events all of you as well It's i would love to thank you so much that was really a wonderful session i feel very stimulated by all your questions and your engagement thank you thank you to everyone uh, have a good evening or day wherever you are <laughs> okay bye